according to the cliche, the State of the Union speeches are supposed to begin with a mad lib. You know, the State of our Union is blank. Uh, I think we can say uh, unequivocally, and, and certainly more than we were aware before the declaration, uh, the disclosures that began uh, with uh, the leaks provided by Edward Snowden this summer, that the State of our Union is watched closely. Um, we have, uh, as a result of these disclosures, learned more about the uh, counterterrorism and surveillance activities of the National Security Agency. Uh, and indeed, beyond the details of any particular program, I'll get into the weeds of those in a second, um, I think we can connect the dots, as the NSA likes to say, and detect a larger pattern, which is that across a number of authorities and programs, we have seen legal powers understood to be broad, but in some sense particularized or limited, interpreted in secret in a way that permits a shift from the traditional mode of monitoring in our constitutional tradition, which is individualized and targeted monitoring of particular individuals and entities based on some measure of suspicion, to wholesale indiscriminate monitoring of entire populations and communication streams as a mechanism for developing that suspicion initially. Uh, and this is an, inc an incredibly disturbing shift. It is motivated uh, by the perceived need to be more proactive, detect uh, terror plots before they occur. Um, but it's something that our judicial mechanisms are pr profoundly ill-suited to, uh, to deal with because they are structured in a way that assumes that old-fashioned targeted model for surveillance. And I think the defects uh, in our court system's ability to handle this expansion have become clear, not just in what Snowden has released, but in the court opinions that, under duress, the government has released. And we can see this sort of pattern across a number of programs. So the most famous one, of course, um, is the 215, Section 215 of the Patriot Act, Telephony Metadata Program that gathers billions of records on basically nearly all Americans' uh, phone conversations and stores them for five years for future use. Uh, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board is now the second uh, expert panel uh, to come out with a report, this is just yesterday, concluding that the 215 telephony program, one, is probably illegal, and two, um, really has provided no serious value. Um, so on the legality, in addition to a, a somewhat speculative constitutional argument, um, you know, the, the authority under which this program operates is supposed to allow the FBI to obtain records that are relevant to a national security investigation. And as the Peaklob points out, like the Holy Roman Empire, it's none of those things. It's not the FBI. They're not obtaining records in the sense that the records they're obtaining don't exist at the time the order is issued. So it's prospectively ordering the companies to produce records that don't yet exist. Um, they're not relevant, except, as the board says, on a definition of relevance that is uh, so circular and broad as to be meaningless. Um, the theory here is that everyone's phone <laughs> records are relevant because you can go on a fishing expedition through all of that data uh, in hopes of turning up some tiny fraction of the records which are relevant. And this is, of course, not the way relevance is used in any other legal context. It's understood to be a limiting factor, uh, a way of requiring a nexus between the documents you're trying to get and the subject of an investigation. Uh, and of course, on this theory, everything is potentially relevant. And the dangerous thing here is it's not just uh, phone records, but any type of record that you could potentially go on a fishing expedition through to detect someone suspicious or that records that might come in handy at some point in the future. Bank records, medical records, um, psychiatrist records, uh, library records, there's credit card records. There's no type of record that in principle could not be relevant in an unlimited form if this is the, the version of relevance that the FISA court has decided to accept. And then finally, it's not relevant to any particular investigation because, of course, they're getting all phone records. There's no nexus between the records they're seeking and any specific investigation. Um, so we see in this case um, an authority, again, understood by nearly everyone who voted for it to be relatively limited. It turns into uh, a kind of limitless uh, power to acquire records on millions of innocent people. Um, predictably enough, uh, even though the FISA court attempted to hedge this around with various safeguards, it learned after three years of the program's operation that, in fact, they had been lied to. They had been, or at least misled, um, systematically over a period of years. So they learned that the program hadn't actually operated under any of the limitations that they had imposed. Um, 
And as a result, the court found uh, the system of safeguards that it had attempted to establish had never functioned effectively. And what are the fruits of this? We initially heard that dozens of terror plots had been foiled as a result of this. Uh, the uh, the PCLOB report goes into this in some detail and essentially finds that that's completely false, um, that there is no case in which this program played any role in disrupting any terror plot. Um, there is one case in which it may have uh, provided some, an additional uh, piece of information about uh, someone who was already under FBI suspicion. But in almost every case, what they found was it not just was it possible for the FBI to obtain all of this information using more traditional targeted orders? But in most cases, the FBI already had obtained that information using traditional targeted orders. Um, so this is a program that, one, is illegal, two, um, appears to have uh, resulted in kind of systematic violations and deceptions of the FISA, co uh, uh, FISA court orders, and three, doesn't seem to have provided any sort of sliver of, of unique usefulness. And yet, despite an unambiguous recommendation from, uh, from the PCLOB and uh, a somewhat more hedged recommendation from the Independent Surveillance Review Group, the president is uh, committed to shifting the data somehow out of government hands, perhaps into Booz Allen's hands, but maintaining something resembling uh, a program that has no proven effectiveness and a program that uh, you know, compiles in one place the kind of data that you know, it provides a really intimate picture of a person's life, uh, information about who might have called a psychiatrist, an abortion provider, a suicide hotline, um, a lover. This is, given the history of intelligence abuse in this country uncovered in the 70s by the Church Committee, uh, a collection of data in one place that we should be extraordinarily wary to authorize unless it serves some compelling security purpose that clearly is not the case in, uh, here. We see similar patterns under other programs. Under the FISA Amendments Act, so uh, provision of that known as Section 702, um, there is authority to gather uh, the content of communications, not just metadata, provided that these are international communications and the target is uh, overseas. And again, what we learned here is that in secret, this was interpreted to provide a broader authority than the people who had voted for it had expected. So in this case, we find, for example, uh, that contrary to what the Supreme Court understood when it uh, did, did, uh, rejected a challenge to this uh, last year, um, that it was not just communications with foreign targets being intercepted, but rather all U.S. international communications, emails and internet communications, were being scanned for foreign selectors. So if you referred to one of the foreign targets in an email, then your communications could be intercepted. And in fact, the FISA court learned after one of these programs was in operation for several months, not just your communications about that foreign target, but your entire inbox. So if you sent one email internationally that mentioned someone on the list of hundreds of thousands of targets maintained by NSA, your entire inbox, including your completely domestic emails, would also be intercepted. And again, after months, the court realized that this is how it was operating, uh, unsurprisingly declared that this was seriously deficient on constitutional and statutory grounds. Uh, a similar pattern, again, was seen with a now defunct uh, program under Section 214 of the Patriot Act. This is the Pen Register Trap and Trace Authority to capture internet metadata. Um, yet again, after some years, the court discovered that the program did not operate in the way it had been represented to them, that more data was being gathered than they had uh, allowed. And then finally, this program was independently shut down because it was decided that it wasn't actually providing much in the way of intelligence value. This also had some serious constitutional defects because the theory under which interception of this kind is not a Fourth Amendment search involves the idea that the company is maintaining business records of its own. Um, about all this information, so that you've already, in some sense, disclosed it to them. Um, information of the kind they were obtaining, though, email headers, is not actually information that your internet service provider normally stores or indeed even looks at. Um, they don't need to look at your email metadata in order to route uh, the packets that you're sending through them. So it was additionally sort of constitutionally dubious. Um, the pattern that emerges, I think, from all of this is that the vastness and complexity of bulk collection is 
not really amenable to oversight. We have a kind of system of Potemkin oversight where the court relies on representations about the operation of these vast programs made to it by intelligence community agencies. Um, and it seems like because there's no opposing side, it tends overwhelmingly to give them whatever they want with very little in the way of effective active oversight. They're essentially dependent on the agencies themselves to make note of it when they discover that, in fact, they've been misleading the court for years at a time. Um, we hear, I think, uh, repeatedly that, that we haven't yet uncovered any abuses of these programs, these very large-scale uh, collection <laughs> efforts. And I find this not very uh, reassuring for a couple of reasons. First, again, it's not clear how you would detect intentional abuse in a case like this. You're dealing, again, with the collection of millions of records, vast databases, and you know, tens of thousands of queries of various different databases every year. So the idea that you, can exercise, that you would be able to notice uh, an intentional abuse when it happens, especially since an abuse may you know, be inherent in what happens in someone's brain with the information after they've required, acquired it as the result of an arguably legitimate query, um, makes us, you know, I think should, should make us think that there isn't much reason to believe it would be detected. Especially when we consider, again, historically, that when past intelligence abuses have occurred, when in the past FBI and NSA systematically spied on labor leaders, civil rights activists, anti-war activists, and other domestic dissidents, they took measures to conceal what they knew were illegal operations. So, for example, J. Edgar Hoover um, took steps to ensure that the results of illegal break-ins and wiretaps did not make it into <coughs> official FBI records so that they could deny, if overseers ever came looking, that there was record of such activities, but rather went directly into Hoover's own personal and confidential file. It was a protocol called June Mail, where these illicit reports would be marked June on the cover and be routed directly to his office. Um, there's one rather amusing case in which a historian found repeated letters from Senator Carl Munt to the FBI asking for uh, their files and intelligence on political opponents. And he kept receiving back letters saying, no, it would not be appropriate for us to share this information with you. Um, and of course, the historian looking at these records became puzzled and found Munt's personal secretary and said, what, what's up with that? What, why did he not get the message? Why did he keep making these requests after getting shot down? Uh, and the secretary explained that, in fact, those refusals were always hand-delivered by an FBI agent who would also come with a briefcase containing all the records that had been requested and say, I'm going to leave these on your desk and, uh, you know, hit the bathroom and make a cup of coffee, uh, and I'll be back to answer any questions you might have. Um, so, you know, this is sort of the Stephen Glass problem in a way. You can, you know, fact-checking is good at finding accidental errors. It's hard at spotting people who are trying to game the system. So what you should expect and what we've seen is you're going to find accidental errors. You're not going to, accidental errors is an excellent word. You're going to find accidental compliance incidents. You're not going to detect the people who are deliberately abusing the system and therefore taking steps knowing how the system works to circumvent it. Remember here that what we're talking about is NSA, which means that whatever security measures you may have in place and safeguards you may have in place to try and prevent this, you are talking about essentially the most elite hacker core in the nation, a group of people hand-selected for their ability to circumvent security. Um, what this says to me, I think, given the demonstrable failure of oversight, is that this shift to wholesale surveillance <laughs> is not really amenable to checks of this kind. And so given the utter lack of demonstrable utility in security, uh, in, in bolstering security or disrupting terror attacks, what we have done under the cover of darkness is created an unprecedented database, an unprecedented architecture of surveillance that is susceptible to the abuse that we know has occurred time after time in the past without rigorous controls. And the concern here for me is that given the enormous secrecy that surrounds it, when those abuses begin to be repeated, we're not likely to know about it until years later, if at all.